Okay, cool. Let's start. So we have some more time to go ahead. Welcome, everyone. Um, I uh, wanted to step in for the presenters that couldn't come by talking about APOC. And let's start with a number of questions. Who of you uses Neo4j? Cool. Good job. Um, who of you knows already what user-defined procedures are? A few? Cool. And who have you, a few of those has you, have used them, actually? Two or four people? And uh, any APOC users? Great. And who of you has written their own procedures so far? Yay! Three, four. Cool. And anyone who contributed to APOC? Thank you, Kiss. Thank you, Axel. Oh, yeah, Axel, right? No. Uh, OK, cool. Um, in general, um, we know Cypher is a quite powerful graph query language, and we can do a lot of stuff with it. But sometimes you are reaching limits of things that we can express or things that we can do. And that's why for Neo4j 3.0, we decided to make the language extensible with user-defined procedures, and later in 3.1 with user-defined functions. That means these are little, piece of pe little pieces of code that you can write yourself, deploy to a Neo4j server, or to deploy to a Neo4j instance that allow you, within your Cypher statements, to call uh, those procedures or these functions and uh, execute whatever you encoded in them or wh whatever someone else encoded them into them. So that could be everything from simple helper functions like date conversions or handling uh, like, uh, like, for instance, geohash, geohashes. Or it could be something like connecting to other databases, pulling data from other databases, graph refactorings. Uh, it could be something like graph algorithms and so on. So there's many, many different opportunities what to do. And it's kind of a really um, nice thing. And um, it somehow beca became a pastime of mine to, to work on those. I started actually a year ago. And a year ago at uh, Graph Connect London, we released the first version of Neo4j 3.0 that supported user-defined procedures, and also released the first version of the APOC procedure library. <laughs> In general, it's, uh, it's just uh, a procedure. Uh, you, you call it with the uh, core keyword, and it yields a stream of results. So it's, um, you can compare it like, uh, like a match clause or a load CSV clause that you call it, and it yields a stream of results. And whatever you want to do with these results is up to you. Either you can use them to match against the graph, to create data from it, uh, to use it to enrich other kind of data that you have. Uh, so it's very open. And to implement it, it's pretty easy, because you just write a little bit of Java code and um, do that. Uh, for Neo4j 3.2, we have some updates. Uh, so one update that's new is we can now write user-defined aggregation functions. So, so far, we have a lot of aggregation functions in, in Cypher already, like the typical min, max, count, collect as, a, as the best one that we've got there, and also things like standard deviation and so on. But oftentimes, you want to have your own custom uh, aggregation functions, like linear regression or other uh, more com complex statistical functions. So that's an, now an easy way to do that. But interestingly, you can also use these aggregation functions for other purposes, because it means you get a stream of data passed into your procedure. And then it's up to you how to, how to deal with the stream of data. So n you're not just generating. or actually, It's actually the inverse to a regular procedure, if you think about it. You're not generating a stream of data, data but you're consuming a stream of data. So you can, for instance, also use it to feed data to a graph algorithm, to export data, for instance. And so on. So whenever you have, you want to accumulate data, but then you want to kind of efficiently uh, process it, then such a user-defined aggregation functions can be helpful. Uh, procedure whitelisting is something that's uh, interesting for operations people or people um, that want to control which kind of uh, procedures and functions your user should be able to execute. So, for instance, if you have to deploy large Neo4j instances, and you might have a large procedure library like APOC, which has like 300 functions and procedures in total. Uh, then you want to say, OK, I actually only want my users to run these uncritical things where they can't mess stuff up or can't break things and so on. Or I want them to run only read-only functions. Um, that, that's whitelisting where you can specify on a, any configuration which procedures to load. Uh, the other thing is uh, procedure sandboxing. So for security reasons, um, 
procedures that use internal APIs for, of Neo4j are now uh, sandboxed, and you have to enable them also in the configuration. And uh, the last thing that's uh, worthwhile mentioning, um, it was added already a bit earlier in Neo4j, but uh, very useful, especially if you develop your own procedures, is the procedure compiler. Um, which is a developer tool that allows you to get feedback on do I have the right annotations, do I have the right parameter types, do I have the right return types of my procedure already at development time, not just when you deploy it into your near uh, server, but already when you write it and you compile your procedure the first time, you already get errors when you kind of violated any of the rules that you have to adhere to for the uh, procedures. Okay, cool. Uh, if you look at this in detail a little bit, so the uh, whitelisting is just a comma-separated list of procedures with white cards that you can say, okay, I want to have these procedures and these procedures and these procedures. Similar to the, sandbox, uh, the sandboxing, you can have a um, configuration entry that says these procedures I trust despite them using internal APIs. Uh, so some of the APOC uh, procedures actually use internal APIs, so you might want to uh, put the uh, um, dose that you want to use into the unrestricted list. Um, if you develop procedures, it might be interesting, there are many more things that you can get injected now as public APIs, as allowed ones, uh, especially things that allow you to control transaction termination, that give you access to security information like who is the current user, is the current user an admin, is the current user in this role or so. So you can have more fine-grained security control in, inside of your procedure. And of course, uh, locks as we used to have. Um, there's also more configuration for role mapping for procedures. Uh, so you can say, what's the default role that can execute procedures? So you can say, okay, not everyone can do it, but you have to be at least a publisher or an admin to execute procedures. Or uh, um, you can also map individual procedures or groups of procedures to certain roles. So you can say, okay, every conversion function, which is only read only and does not destroy data, uh, can be executed by the reader role. Every uh, export function can be, um, uh, every loading function uh, can be uh, expo uh, uh, used by the writer role. And for instance, triggers which are in APOC can be used by role that's called, in this case, trigger happy. Um, so that's a fine grained control for administrators if they want to make sure that only the right uh, people can execute procedures. Uh, just as a recap, um, to go from procedures to functions is actually quite helpful because user-defined functions can be used in any expression context. That means in any kind of mass expression, other expressions, string expressions, but also in predicates. So they are much more convenient to call because it's like a built-in function. And uh, so instead, this was the old syntax in 3.0 that you had to do for calling a procedure uh, to achieve, for instance, a UUI and time conversion. And fortunately, now these are all functions and you can, can call them inline and it's much more convenient to, to, that, to not do that. If you want to write one, this is kind of almost the simplest version of a uh, function. You just annotate it with user function, and then you have a small Java method or Kotlin method or a Groovy method, uh, whatever JVM language you want to use, and uh, you can uh, write these functions. Something that's new is these aggregation functions that I mentioned before. This is a really simple example for creating a um, max function your own. I mean, we have some one built in, but that was kind of the shortest example that I could come up with and uh, which just computes the maximum of a numeric value. So you have an aggregation uh, variable here, and then you have an, an aggregation update function, annotated one, that gets passed in each individual value. And then uh, inside of the function, of course, you decide what to do. In this case, when the value is larger than the max value, we update the max value. And then there's a separate function that is, has, contains the aggregation result, which is kind of whatever you want to return as the uh, result of that. And uh, the um, user aggregation function just creates a new instance of this uh, max function class. And that's about it. And that's kind of the basics that you need to write uh, your own custom aggregation functions, which can be really powerful. OK, uh, APOC. So as you know, Cypher can do a lot, and uh, procedures and functions to the rescue. Uh, but then on the other hand, you also don't, you don't want to require everyone to write their own version of, of things, right? And that's why uh, I started early on when this um, user-defined function feature started in Neo4j 3.0 to, to play around with that and build the first few graph refactoring uh, procedures. 
And in, in the end, uh, it more or less evolved into a standard library of um, user-defined procedures and functions. And it's very, uh, uh, very widely used. So a lot of our field team uses many prospects and customers uses many uh, Neo4j community users uh, use APOC for achieving lots of different things. And I'll come uh, to that in a second. So currently, we have more than 300 uh, procedures and functions in APOC, uh, which is really uh, comprehensive. And um, we have many uh, contributors, and uh, so activity recently has grown a lot because uh, my friends uh, from Italy, from Laros, uh, joined us for really uh, focused um, APOC development and uh, implementing uh, new features, fixing bugs, adding documentation, clarifying issues, and so on. So you see on our uh, development board that we got quite a lot of stuff done in these uh, two months. So thanks a lot to Lorenzo and uh, the others of the team. I'm really happy to have you. Uh, really excited that we can do that. Uh, in general, APOC can do a lot of things. So we can provide meta information about the graph structure, about types. We can do conversions between date, date and time and, and strings. Uh, there are a ton of collection utilities, um, especially for handling uh, uh, collection operations like joining them, map operations, and so on. A lot of data import and export. Uh, which means that I can connect to relation databases, I can collect to, connect to Couchbase, to MongoDB, to Elasticsearch, to Cassandra, and um, uh, JSON endpoints, XML endpoints, and so on, to get data into, into Neo4j and then create my graph model, or update my graph model from that. Uh, but I can also export data to uh, GraphML, to JSON, to um, a different formats, and I can, for instance, also do things like streaming data to Gephi uh, to have incremental uh, visual graph updates in, in Gephi, for instance. Um, there are a number of graph algorithms in APOC, but I'll come to that later. And you can do uh, graph refactorings and also controlled execution of, uh, of Cypher, which is really interesting, especially if you do large scale updates and you want to have, let's say, you want to have update a million nodes or 100 million nodes. Uh, you can't do it in a single transaction because you need uh, more memory for that. So APOC has some uh, procedures that allow you to actually iterate over batches of data and do each of them in, a, in an individual uh, transaction. Uh, other things that we have is, uh, for instance, time to live functionality and, and triggers and parallelization. So I can, for instance, actually I should have put that into my uh, sh presentation. I'm not sure why I didn't do that. But let me just, oops, come on. Uh, I just want to show you something cool. Um, so, just a second here. So, this, for instance, is a 144 CPU machine that's busy executing a single cipher statement uh, using an epoch function to parallelize uh, a pass expansion and aggregation here. So. So we can do something like that, that we have a little bit of a cipher statement. Then we say, please execute this bit in parallel. And then whatever comes back from this bit, we aggregate with a sum function here. And it, you see it ke keeps 140 CPUs busy uh, to compute that on a large graph. So it's like a 200 million node graph or something like that. And, um, and it improved runtime with by two orders of magnitude uh, to, to do that. So I should have put that into the presentation. Anyway. Um, so these are all things that you can do uh, with APOC. And uh, for 3.2, we did a lot of uh, concrete works, work on issues. Uh, but in general, the general updates are that we made it work with 3.2, especially all the sandboxing changes were a bit tricky to, to get in. Um, we uh, um, want to do more work on that. Uh, we have also some uh, views and really cool feature of the procedure compiler, which is also able to um, where is it? To generate um, during its, its run um, output uh, for all the procedures and functions that you have in your project. And we can just include this output into our documentation. And now we have a searchable table of all the procedures. So, for instance, if I want to search for, let's say, um, map functions, I can, can just uh, in the documentation uh, have online. Uh, um, for instance, online search for certain functions, and it's kind of on the fly, so it's really handy to uh, figure out functions. But
But if you want to do this in, in your browser, of course, you can use just um, co uh, epoch dot help, uh, for instance, clean, and then you also get the information. And it also shows you the signature of the, uh, of the procedure or function. And so it's really easy built-in help that gives you uh, easy access to that. Um, other updates that we did is for all the JSON functions, so load JSON and, and, and setting and getting JSON, uh, you can now provide a JSON pass argument, so similar to an XPass argument where you can reach into JSON to uh, extract values. Uh, uh, Stefan Armbruster added auto update for manual indexes. I'll show you an example uh, quite soon. We have lots of new collection functions, and especially Andrew Bauman uh, added a lot of them. Uh, he also expanded the functionality of parse expansion. So you can do now uniqueness of parse expansion. You can control min and max uh, scope. You have functions like cover neighbors, a minimum spanning tree in, in parse expansion. So it's really cool stuff. Um, team at uh, Larus worked on making manual index functions truly real only, which are s is currently still a tricky thing. And something that uh, was widely welcomed as well was that uh, we have now a really good performance improvement for Epoch Periodic Iterate, um, which allows you to pass in a, um, a batch as a collection to the inner uh, statement, which is handled automatically. So you get uh, up to 10 to um, uh, ten times faster uh, insertion speed, for instance, with that. And things that we also did was to uh, update uh, Epoch to honor the uh, Neo4j uh, config for read and writes. Okay, we order also added some pages on neo4j.com slash developer uh, about procedures and functions with a detailed gallery of all the stuff that's available. So if you want to quick search stuff on Google, you should also find that. Um, so uh, I probably have to skip over the data, uh, over the demo. But we want to add many more things, especially also uh, things like um, numeric functions for banking applications. So uh, large uh, scale uh, operations, bit set sequences, uh, also parallel self execution across a cluster, and um, more export formats, and, and so on. So, we have a lot of ideas, also history graph support, and, and so on. And uh, I want to announce that we have a new project. It's called Neo4j Graph Algorithms. I hope that we can release the first version probably next week, which contains a lot of parallel uh, graph algorithms uh, that I've been working on for a bit now with, uh, with a group in Germany. And we, uh, uh, it's already on GitHub, uh, so if you want to have the first look, the documentation is still a bit rough, uh, but it contains um, algorithms, uh, uh, lots of centrality algorithms, but also clustering algorithms like label find, uh, uh, yeah, um, Union find, label propagation, Louvain, and, and similar things, strongly and weakly connected components, and so on. And it's currently still work in progress, but we paralyzed the, the loading and the writing stage of results, and we are now on paralyzing the uh, algorithms. Uh, so this is a really exciting area, which I hope we can make available really soon. And then you can uh, use all of these algorithms and hopefully many more to come. If you want to contribute to that, please ping me, grab me later on, and then we'll uh, can work on that together. Okay, and that's it uh, for me. And uh, thank you. Can we take questions, or don't we have time for questions? I think